Hey, we are reading chapter 3 of Jonah today. And so here is God's word through the prophet Jonah. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. This is God's word to us this morning. So Jonah's four chapters long, and we're on chapter three today, and it's all really one story. So if you're here for the, if you're here for the other two, you're in the middle of the story. So let me catch you up. In Jonah 1 and 2, we find out that Jonah is a prophet of God. And a prophet has one job, to hear a message from God, and then to take that message to whomever God wanted to hear that message. Well, God wanted that message delivered to Nineveh, the capital of Syria, the enemies of the Israelites. And Jonah said, no thank you. I would not like to do that. And instead of going to Nineveh, which is 550 miles over land, he said, ah, I'm going to hop on a ship and go 2,500 miles to Tarshish, about as far away in the known world from Nineveh as I can get. Well, God wasn't up there being like, oh, no, what am I going to do now? No, God said, no, Jonah, you're going to do what I say, and I'm going to get your attention. I'm going to hurl a great storm on you. And it was such a great storm not great in the sense of gay, happy storm. No, this was a very awful storm. And to the point that these professional <coughs> sailors thought that the ship was going to just break apart. They were all going to drown in the sea. And they think to themselves, because they're crying out to their gods, these sailors, and their gods aren't answering. And they're saying, well, whose fault is this that this great storm has come upon us? They cast lots, and the lots fall on Jonah. And they say, Jonah, what'd you do? And Jonah's like, yeah, it's my bad. Yeah, this is me. Uh, yeah, this is because of my disobedience. And so the sailors are like, well, what are we supposed to do? And Jonah says, you got to throw me overboard. Now here we go. Jonah probably could have just repented and said, well, if all I have to do is repent, then God will forgive me. We'll turn the ship around and we'll be good. But Jonah basically says, no, if you throw me in and I die, then the storm will probably be done. But I would rather die than actually repent of what I'm doing. So they throw Jonah in, and Jonah is drowning. He's going under, and he has to change of heart as he begins to drown. He says, okay, maybe this wasn't a good idea. And he calls out to God, not verbally, because he's drowning. It would be pretty hard to call on God. But in his heart and his mind, he's crying out to the Lord to save him. And we learned last week, God already was ready. He had a what is called a great fish in Jonah, prepared to save Jonah if Jonah repented. Now, of course, we don't know what that great fish was. Many think it perhaps a sperm whale. And it swallowed Jonah alive, and Jonah lived, was able to live in this great fish for, two, uh, for three days and three nights. And finally, the end of chapter 2 last week, we read this. And this is after the three days. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Having saved Jonah, God now gives Jonah a second chance to obey him. Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 say this, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now this command by God, the second command by God, is a little different from the first. If we go back to the beginning of Jonah, here was the first command. 
God said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Because of its wickedness has come up, up before me. So chapter 1, God tells Jonah to preach against the city. Preach against its wickedness. And, uh, but this second one, there's not, nothing about that at all. It's just, Jonah, just preach the message I give you. God doesn't say preach against Nineveh. It doesn't say preach against its wickedness. So Jonah really has a second testament. And it's harder than the first one because this message, the second message, may be a bit more positive than the first. Perhaps this message isn't one of complete judgment like the first one. Maybe the message will now be one of judgment and of potential salvation. Now, if Jonah didn't like the first message, he's going to hate this message. If he ran away in the opposite direction because of that first command, what is Jonah going to do now? Well, thankfully, this time Jonah obeys. Verse 3. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. You see, Jonah just experienced God's wrath and discipline against his disobedience. And having experienced it firsthand, he changed his mind this time. Well, not only that, he also experienced God's salvation, didn't he? Jonah is, having experienced all this, much more agreeable this time to obey God. Even though he still probably doesn't like the job, he probably still doesn't like the message. But he's going to do it. He obeys and goes to Nineveh. And really, that, this is what obedience is all about. It's doing something even if we don't like it. It's trusting in God's word and in God's ways over our own limited understanding. Biblical obedience is doing what you're told, when you're told, with the right heart attitude. And that's really easy to say to kids. But that is for us, too. Biblical obedience, what God expects for us is to do what we're supposed to do, when we're supposed to do it, with the right heart attitude. But as we're going to see later in this sermon, and especially next week in chapter 4, Jonah's obedience is uh, lacking, shall we say, when it comes to that heart attitude. But Jonah, to his credit, does do what God wants him to do, even if he has some personal frustration with the assignment. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went to Nineveh, that great city. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit, a visit required three days, meaning that big. If you wanted to walk through Nineveh, it's going to take you three days' walk to get through. Uh, and on the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. Now, what were the results of his obedience? And my guess is this was probably half hearted obedience. Jonah's probably going through and saying, uh, 40 more days, and Nineveh's going to be overturned. Nineveh is going to get overturned Shh. because he really doesn't want them to repent. Maybe a little bit louder than that, but still. What is the results? Verse 5. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast, they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. That's pretty incredible. The people actually believe what Jonah is saying. They believe he is speaking for God. And they believe the message so much that they actually call a fast. They put on sackcloth. In other words, they are repenting before God. They are trying to seek God's favor. But it doesn't just stop there with the people. Look who else responds in verse 6. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe uh, from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. Even the king responded to Jonah's message. And I love how kind of this is shown. First, he gets up out of his throne, out of his seat of power, his seat of authority. Then he lays off, takes off his robe, which was his sign of his authority. And then he covers himself with sackcloth and sits in ashes and dust. In his repentance and humility, the king is purposely demeaning himself in front of his people as a way of showing them that he too is under authority. There's an even greater authority than his own, God's authority. And after that, the king made this proclamation to all the people of this massive city of Nineveh. The king declared, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. So even the animals got a fast, apparently. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Now, just to make clear what the people and the king did by putting on sackcloth and sitting in ashes, uh, by fasting, that wasn't the repentance. 
Instead, it was their already sincere repentance that led them to want to do these things. Their internal repentance was so sincere that they desired to fast, to put on sackcloth, to sit in ashes, as an outward sign of this inner change of heart. You know, and that's right and true for us today as well. You know, we realize that we are not saved by our outward humble, outward humbling ourselves. We're not saved by doing lots of good stuff for God. We are saved by humbling our hearts before God and trusting in Him and His salvation rather than trusting in ourselves, trusting in our own works to save us. But as part of their true repentance, part of that true, sincere faith, it's going to naturally lead to outward acts. It will lead us to want to seek God. It will lead us to want to reform our ways and please God, want to do good and sacrificial things for God. Again, not to earn God's love, but because of God's love. What God did for us through Jesus Christ so moves us, and now we desire to do things for God and others as a way to say thank you, God. As a way to say, God, this is how much you mean to me. When speaking about his followers, Jesus said this. He says, by their fruit, by their fruit, you will know them. And what he meant is that those who naturally follow him are going to show in their lives good fruit. And that's going to demonstrate that they are his. <clears throat> now, any of you with fruit trees know that the fruit doesn't make a tree good. If that were the case, you might go find, go to the store, find the best fruit you can, and tie it onto the, or tape it onto your tree. But that doesn't work that way. We know that instead, fruit shows the health of a tree whether a tree is good or not. And same with these acts of repentance for the Ninevites. These acts don't make the people or king repent. Rather, these acts show that they already are repentant in their hearts. Now, let me pause for a short excursus. Last week we talked about the historicity of Jonah and the great fish that swallowed him. We talked about how that story for some people is very hard to believe because of the miraculous nature of what happened. But let me tell you for some other people, the hardest thing to believe in the story of Jonah is not that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. Rather, the most difficult thing for them to believe from the book of Jonah is what happened here in Nineveh. So let's remember, these people are Assyrians. They are enemies of God's people. The Assyrians had their own prophets. They have their own gods. Now, at least when it came to the military and their kings, they were a people without a conscience when it came to their enemies or anyone who would dare rebel against them. And next week we're going to get into a little bit more detail about that. But suffice it to say, as I said last week, some of the things that they did would make ISIS blush. It was that bad. And yet somehow, somehow these people, these same people, listened to a prophet from one of their enemies. I mean, just think about it. The very fact that John just isn't killed when he's in Nineveh and proclaiming that Nineveh is going to be destroyed, you think they would capture him and kill him? I mean, that's a miracle in and of itself. But the fact that they actually listened to Jonah and repented, they actually humbled themselves, and not just a few people either, but we're told at the end of the next chapter that there are 120,000 people in Nineveh, and that we, the least to the greatest repented, including the king, and then the king issued this proclamation calling on all of them to repent who hadn't yet repented. This is really hard to believe, especially when you consider that Jonah was probably half-hearted in his delivery, as I mentioned before. Eh, 40 more days, guys. Shh, don't tell them. You're going to be destroyed. Don't, tell them. don't actually repent. But let me give you a short history lesson concerning the kings of Assyria up to and after Jonah. There's something that that's interesting that happens in the historical record for the king during Jonah's day, and the, that succeed him immediately. Very interesting. So let's start with Shalmaneser III, 858 to 824. He reigned 35 years, and during those 35 years, he had 31 military campaigns. This is a guy who liked to fight, who liked to kill, who liked to expand the Assyrian Empire. That's exactly what he did. Expanded it greatly, actually. His son after him was Shamshi Adad V, 824 to 811. Now, during his reign, what happened was not that the, the uh, Assyrian Empire expanded. No, there was actually a civil war. 
And what Shamshi Adad did was that he took those who rebelled against him and treated them in such a torturous, violent, and vicious manner, purposely, so that anyone else who would dare rise up against him would hear about what he did to these other re uh, rebels, and that they would say to themselves, uh, I think twice, I don't think we're going to do this. After him was his son, Adad Narari III, 811 to 783. He expanded Assyria even more now that the civil war had been put to rest, and he conquered actually most of the ancient Near East, making all of them pay tribute to Assyria. Basically, they would come in and say, hey, your nation wants to exist? You know what we've done to the other nations, right? Well, you can insist if you uh, pay us a lot of money and you bow to our rule. And if not, we'll do to you what we've done to these other people and, and basically wipe you out. And that's what he would do. And at this point, Syria has become a true empire. Now, after him, his son, Shalmaneser IV, 782-773 BC, he would have been the king that heard Jonah preach to him. And rough estimates, they think of pre about 780 BC is when Jonah was there. Now, Shalmaneser inherited a large empire at its height, whose increasing power and violence kept the conquered people in order and allowed them to continue to expand their empire. So what did he do with that? We'll come back to him in just a second. Now after him, his son, Ashurdagon II, the historical record is very quiet for his reign. There's little known of his rule. It's very different from those before Shalmaneser, and we'll see those after him. Very quiet, not much we know about. Him. And after him, his son, Ashur Narari, again, very quiet reign. And all we know about him is at the end of his reign, at seven, so nine years into his reign, he was killed through a palace revolt by this man, Tiglath Pelzer III. And with him, we go back to basically what these kings were like in violence and military campaigns, in torture, and in the most vicious behaviors you can imagine. But with these three, it flatlines. It's the only time in the centuries of Assyrian history that we just have a quiet period. Now what's interesting is that those, Tiglath and those who came after him, when they wrote about this man, Shalmaneser IV, they said things like, he was weak and inept. He was a loser. In fact, most of the kings before him would record all of their accomplishments and victories and they would boast how they're the greatest king yet. But when we get to these three, nothing. It gets really quiet. Now, from one viewpoint, maybe Shalmaneser was weak and inept. Maybe he was a loser. But from another viewpoint, maybe he just repented. Maybe he changed and kept his people and his armies from acting in these atrocious ways that we're going to talk about next week. Perhaps he stopped using power and violence as a means of controlling people. Now, granted, we don't have any Assyrian documents that tell us that's exactly what happened. That Shalmaneser IV heard Jonah speak and he repented and reformed his ways, but this, these 30 years of quietness in the historical record at least are consistent with what we read in the story of Jonah. For 30 years, we got this quiet in Assyria, and historians have no idea why that is. But I don't think we can rule out Jonah 3 as a possibility of contributing to this quiet record. All right. Now, of course, all this is pretty amazing because we remember that Jonah was not a powerful preacher. Jonah was not a saint. Jonah was brought a half-hearted message to these people. So we might say, well, how in the world did this happen with Jonah? This seems incredible. How can we explain this? Well, I think there's only one thing we, way we can explain, and that is that God's word is very powerful. The word of the Lord is very powerful. We think in Isaiah 55, 11, God says this, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. In the New, in the New Testament, Hebrews 4, 12, it says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Let's remember what Jonah told us last week. 
Jonah's testimony after he was saved by God was this. He says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. Salvation is from God. God sent his prophet, and even with a half-hearted proclamation, God's word is powerful enough to achieve the purpose for which God sent it. And amazingly, do you know what that word was? Was this a word pleading with the Ninevites, oh, please return to God, please? Was it a word of salvation and grace and mercy and compassion? No. The only word they heard was a word of judgment. Jonah's message was 40 more days and Nineveh is going to be overturned. That is all he said. There was no like, unless you repent, unless you turn from your evil ways. 40 more days. Now perhaps God didn't want Jonah to tell the people to repent and turn to him. Now, who knows? But the only message they heard was that of judgment and destruction. And because of that, all the people and the kings, they were eager not just to inwardly repent, they were very eager to repent outwardly as well. Kind of say, God, look at us, see, we really are repenting, so don't destroy us. The fact that they only heard a message of judgment also explains this line from the king's proclamation. Because after he commanded all the people to fast and put on sackcloth, give up their evil ways, King Shalmaneser IV said this, Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Who knows? Who knows if God will have mercy on us disobedient people? Who knows? Well, you know who would have known? Jonah would have known. Jonah knew God's word. Jonah knew that when God's own people back in the Exodus, when Moses on top of the mountain getting the, getting the law of the Lord, what did they do? Ah, we don't know what this Moses had been gone for. Hey, Aaron, brother of Moses, why don't you build for us a, a God? Why don't you make a golden calf? We'll worship that. And Aaron's like, okay. And they did. And even then, God still forgave their, his people when they humbled themselves. God knew or Jonah knew God's compassion for his own people. And Jonah also knew God's compassion and salvation personally. Think about it. Just last week, Jonah chapter 2. Jonah was saved by God after he humbled himself as he was drowning. Jonah was disobedient like the Ninevites, and yet God saved Jonah when he repented. But apparently that part of God's message was not given to the Ninevites. It was not given to King Shalmaneser IV. Jonah's message was only that of judgment, and even though he knew about God's compassion, for those who repent. Now perhaps Jonah didn't share that with his enemies because he thought that he and Israel had a monopoly on God's compassion. That was only for them. They were the ones who got the second and third and fourth chances from God. But not those outside of Israel, not their enemies. They don't get them. So the Ninevites repented and I could only hope that God could be compassionate and show mercy to them. They had absolutely no assurance from Jonah that, that, that God would do that. And what an awful thing to not know. Could you imagine being under God's judgment and have no way of knowing if you could ever get out of it? If you could ever get God's forgiveness? If you could ever be, don't know, you can never know if you could ever be okay with that, at peace with God. Always worry that at any moment God would drop his hammer on you for your past sins. Friends, I suspect that there are some of you here today who live like this. You have placed your faith and trust in Jesus, but you don't feel forgiven. You, don't, you think that God is still going to drop his hammer on you for your sins. And because of that, you don't really feel that close to God. You don't feel that close to God because you aren't sure where you stand with God. And like King Shalmaneser IV, you say to yourself, who knows? Who knows if God really loves me? Who knows if God's going to change his mind and drop his hammer and punish me? Who knows? Friends, we know. We know better than the Ninevites knew. We, heck, we know even better than Jonah knew. We know the extent of God's love and mercy because we know about Jesus. We know how he died in our stead. We know how he took the hammer of God's judgment and allowed it to fall on him instead of us. We know how he died to pay the punishment for our sins, died to make it possible for us to be right with God, to be at peace with God. As Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, that's when Christ died for us, not when we cleaned up our act. 
And if by faith you turn to God in repentance for your sins and trusted in Him as your only source of salvation, God's mighty powerful word declares this in Romans 5. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace. And not only that, but you become a child of God. You're forgiven. You're made clean. You're, you become a new creation. You are given God's spirit. You are adopted into God's family. And all of those things are true and will never change. Not because you've earned them, not because you feel them, but because of God's mighty word and God's promises. God always keeps his promises. The complete message that Jonah should have given to the Ninevites was not just a message of judgment and doom, but it was one of hope and mercy and grace and compassion. That should have been the full message. God is compassion to all, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, if you will humble yourself in repentance and believe his word. That was a message known only in part by the Ninevites, but which we know fully through Jesus Christ. And it's the same message we are called to share, not half-heartedly like Jonah, but wholeheartedly with those in our lives as well. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that nobody has a monopoly on your compassion and love. That it is free and available to anyone, anywhere, no matter what. Father, we realize that that is conditional, though. It requires action on our part. We do need to turn to you and confess our sins. And, have, and trust in you. And Father, you promise that all who do that, no matter what, you will have compassion on them, that you will forgive them, that you will love them, and you will never leave them nor forsake them. Father, I pray for anyone in, in the sanctuary today who is struggling with that, who has committed themselves to you, but just doesn't, doesn't know where they stand with you. I pray that they would see these verses and know that no matter what they feel or think, that this is the truth. That we have peace with you because of what Jesus has done. And we know what Jesus has done that hasn't changed. That's, Jesus died and rose again. That, is, that has not changed. And therefore your promise to us will never change. So Father, help us to trust in you over our own feelings or over our, over our own doubts. We thank you for these promises that are ours only through Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.